Well, hello, everybody. Mr. Mac here. Uh, back for another reading of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I can't wait because we are at Chapter 7. We are beginning today at Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is entitled Charlie's Birthday. Now, we know what has happened up to this point. Wonka has sent out golden tickets throughout the entire world, only five across the whole world. Five children who will find those five tickets will be invited to Wonka's factory to be given a tour of the factory by Willy Wonka himself, and only those five children. And uh, two of the tickets have already been found. The first ticket was Augustus Gloop, uh, a kid who just can't do anything all day long but eat. And uh, a, a young lady by the name of Veruca Salt. And Veruca Salt was a spoiled little girl. Her, every time she wanted something, her father made sure she had it. Uh, her father was in the nut business, peanuts, salted nuts and whatnot, and made sure that his little girl had everything she ever wanted, and uh, no matter what it was. And if she didn't get it right then and there, she would kick and scream and lose her little bitty mind. Uh, that's what a spoiled child is. You give them everything they want. And when they don't get something, they get all uptight. And then he would give her something to shut her up or to make her smile. So two tickets had been found. Charlie is hoping, hoping, hoping that he will be able to find one. At first he thought he knew he would never be able to find one because his family's poor. And uh, the, the, the cabbage is the only thing they have to eat. A candy bar, my goodness, there's no money for that. Except on his birthday, which happens to be now. This, this five tickets out in the world, five golden tickets couldn't have come at a better time. So his birthday, his birthday. When we left chapter six, he was going to bed uh, at the end of chapter six. And his mom reminding it, reminded him, remember darling, it's your birthday tomorrow. <gasps> Am I going to get my chocolate bar? And mother said, yes, my dear. Yes, my darling, you are. So everyone in the fa uh, family, all the grandparents, uh, and Charlie's mom and dad are hoping, hoping, and hoping that he, when he opens his candy bar, his birthday present, he will see a flash of gold. All right, so chapter seven, Charlie's birthday. Happy birthday, cried the four grandparents as Charlie came into the room early the next morning. Charlie smiled nervously and sat down on the edge of the bed. He was holding his present, his only present, very carefully in two hands. Wonka's whipple scrumptious fudge mellow delight, it said on the wrapper. The four old people who Two at, uh, at either end of the bed propped themselves up on their pillows and stared with anxious eyes at the candy bar in Charlie's hand. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket came in and stood at the foot of the bed watching Charlie. The room became silent. Everybody was waiting now for Charlie to start opening his present. Charlie looked down at the candy bar. He ran his fingers slowly back and forth along the length of it, stroking it lovingly in the shiny paper. Wrapper made little sharp, crackly noises in the quiet room. Then Mrs. Bucket said gently, you mustn't be too disappointed, darling, if, if you don't find what you're looking for underneath that wrapper. You really can't expect to be as lucky as all that. She's quite right, said Mr. Bucket. Charlie didn't say anything. After all, Grandma Josephine said, in the whole wide world, there are only three tickets left to be found, my dear. The thing to remember, Grandma Georgina said, is that whatever happens, you'll still have the bar of chocolate. Wonka's whipple scrumptious fudge mellow delight, cried Grandpa George. It's the best of them all. You'll just love it. Yes. Yes, Charlie whispered. I know. Oh. Just forget all about those golden tickets and enjoy the candy, said Grandpa Joe. Why don't you just do that? They all knew it was ridiculous to expect this one poor little candy bar to have a magic ticket inside. 
and they were trying as gently as and as kindly as they could to prepare Charlie for the disappointment. But there was one other thing that the grown-ups also knew, and it was this, that however small the chance might be of striking lucky, the chance was there. There was a chance, no matter how small. The chance had to be there. This particular candy bar had as much chance as any other of having the golden ticket. And that was why all the grandparents and parents in the room were actually just as tense and excited as Charlie was, although they were pretending to be very calm. You'd, you'd better go and go ahead and open it up. You'll be late for school, said Grandpa Joe. You might as well get it over with, Grandpa George said. Open it, my dear, Grandma Georgina said. Please, please open it. You're making me jumpy. Very slowly, Charlie's fingers began to tear open one small corner of the wrapping paper. And as you can see, you can see it there. The old people in the bed all leaned forward, craning their scraggy necks. Then suddenly, as though it, he couldn't bear the suspense any longer, Charlie tore the paper right down the middle, and onto his lap there it fell, a light brown, creamy-colored chocolate candy bar. There was no sign of a golden ticket anywhere. Well, that's that. Grandpa Joe, George said. Yes, that's that, Charlie, said Grandpa Joe. It's just what we expected. Charlie looked up. Four kind old faces were watching him intently from the bed, smiling. He smiled at them, a, a small sad smile. And then he shrugged one shoulder and picked up the candy bar and held it out to his mother and said, Here, mother. Have a bit. We'll share it. I want everybody to taste it. Certainly not, Charlie, his mother said. And the others all cried, no, no. We wouldn't dream of it. It's all yours, Charlie. Please, begged Charlie, turning around and offering it to Grandpa Joe. But neither he nor anyone else would take even a tiny bite. It's time to go to school, my darling, Mrs. Bucket said, putting an arm around Charlie's skinny shoulders. Come on, or you'll be late. The end of chapter seven, poor Charlie. He had hoped and he had hoped, and all of the grown-ups being older and more wise, they kind of expected there to be, to not be, a, a ticket there, knowing that the odds were very slim but they hoped too for Charlie. Didn't happen. And good Charlie, good hearted Charlie, as gracious as he was and as let down as he was, he was certainly willing to share his delicious chocolate bar with his family. They didn't take it, of course, but he was willing to do that. Uh, Charlie's Bucket, uh, Charlie's, <laughs> Charlie Bucket's mother reminds me of my mother very much. I remember thinking that even even as a little dude, um, maybe not when I was in third grade, because uh, that was I, you know. But as as I got older and had read this m multiple times, um, my mother would do that. She always hoped and encouraged and was supportive of anything I wanted to do. But at the same time, she would say, "Jimmy, please, don't get your hopes up too high, buddy." She said, "If if it doesn't happen, whatever it might be." It's going to be all right. Try again or go a different path, but no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. My mother was very much like Mrs. Bucket, letting me know the truth and the reality of the situation, but still having hope. Chapter 8, two more golden tickets found. <gasps> so that would be four. There's only five. So... That evening, Mr. Bucket's newspaper announced the finding of not only the third golden ticket, but the fourth as well. Two golden tickets found today, screamed the headlines. Only one more left. 
All right, said Grandpa Joe when the whole family was gathered in the old people's room after supper. Let's hear who found them. Um, the third ticket, read Mr. Bucket, holding the newspaper up close to his nose because his eyes were bad and he couldn't afford glasses. The third ticket was found by a Miss Violet Beauregard. There was great excitement in the Beauregard household when our reporter arrived to interview the lucky young lady. Cameras were clicking and flashbulbs were flashing and people were pushing and jostling and trying to get a bit closer to the famous girl. And the famous girl was standing on a chair in the living room, waving the golden ticket madly at arm's length, though she was like she was flagging a taxi. She was talking very fast and very loudly to everyone, but that was not but it was not easy to hear all that she said because she was chewing so ferociously upon a piece of gum. I'm a gum chewer normally, she shouted. But when I heard about this ticket thing of Mr. Wonka's, I laid off it for a while. Now, of course, I'm right back on the gum. I just adore the gum. I adore it. I can't do without it. I munch it all day long except for the few minutes at mealtime when I take it out and stick it behind my ear. Back here for safekeeping. To tell you the truth, the honest truth, I simply wouldn't feel comfortable if I didn't have this little wedge of gum to chew on every minute of the day. I really wouldn't. My mom says, it's not ladylike and it looks ugly to see a girl's jaws working up and down all the time like a cow. I don't agree. And who's she to criticize anyway? Because if you ask me, I'd say that her jaws are going up and down almost as much as mine are, just from yelling at me every minute of the day. Now, Violet, said Mrs. Beauregard, far across the room where she was standing near the piano to avoid being trampled by the mob. All right, mother, keep your hair on, Miss Beauregard shouted. Now, she went on, turning to the reporters again, it may interest you to know that this piece of gum here, I've been chewing on this moment right now. I've been working on it for the last three months. That's a record. That's a record. It's uh, beaten, the record, I beat, held by my friend, Miss Cornelia pritz Metal. Yep, I beat, the, I beat the record. And was she mad when I beat it? Huh? It's my most treasured possession now, this piece of gum. At nights, I just stick it at the end of my bedpost, and it's as good as ever in the mornings. A bit hard at first, but maybe after a while it softens up, and I've gotten it a, a few good chews in. Before I started chewing for the world record, I used to change my piece of gum once a day. I used to do it. Used to do it in the elevator on the way home from school. Why the elevator? Well, because I like sticking the gooey piece that I just finished with it on the elevator buttons. Then the next person who comes along and presses the button got my old gum on their finger. <laughs> oh, and what a racket. What a racket they kicked up some of them. They yelled, oh, it was funny. You get the best results with women who have, you know, those expensive gloves on. Oh, yes, I'm thrilled to be going to Mr. Wonka's factory. And I understand that afterwards, he's going to give me gum to last me for the rest of my life. Whoopee! Hooray! Beastly girl, said Grandma Josephine. Despicable, said Grandma Georgina. She'll come to a sticky end one day, chewing all that gum. You see if she doesn't. Uh, and who got the fourth golden ticket, Daddy? Charlie asked. Um, now let me see, said Mr. Bucket, peering at the newspaper again. Uh, ah, yes, here we are. The fourth golden ticket uh, was found by a boy called Mike TV. Another bad lot. I'll be bound, muttered Grandma Josephine. Don't interrupt, Grandma, said Miss Bucket. 
The TB household, said Mr. Bucket, going on with his reading, was crammed like all the others with excited visitors when our reporter arrived, but young my TB, the lucky winner, seemed extremely annoyed by the whole business. Can't you fools see I'm watching telly? He said angry. I wish you wouldn't interrupt. The nine-year-old boy was seated before an enormous television set with his eyes glued to the screen, and he was watching a film in which one bunch of gangsters was shooting up another bunch of gangsters with machine guns. Mike TV himself had no less than 18 toy pistols of various sizes hanging from belts around his body, and every now and again he would leap up into the air and fire off a half a dozen rounds from one or another of these weapons. Quiet, he shouted when someone tried to ask him a question. Didn't I tell you not to interrupt? This show's an absolute whiz-banger. It's terrific. I watch it every day, and I watch all of them that come on every day, even the crummy ones, where there's no shooting. I like the gangsters best. They're terrific, those gangsters. Especially when they start pumping each other full of lead, flashing those old stilettos, giving each other one of the, the one, two, three. They're knuckle dusters. Oh, boy. Wouldn't I give to be one of them myself? It's the life, I tell you, it's terrific. That's quite enough, please, snapped Grandma Josephine. Oh, I can't bear to listen to that boy. Nor me, said Grandma Georgina. Do all children behave like that nowadays? Like these brats we've been hearing about? Of course not, said Mr. Bucket, smiling at the old lady in bed. Some do, of course, in fact, quite a lot of them do, but no, not all. And now there's only one ticket left, said Grandpa George. Quite so, said Grandma Georgina. And just as sure as I'll be having cabbage soup for supper tomorrow, that ticket will go to some nasty little beast who doesn't deserve it. And that's the end of chapter eight. Well, we know what happened and we know what didn't happen. Charlie didn't find his ticket in his birthday bar of chocolate. Two other tickets had been found. However, uh, Violet Beauregard, who just loved chewing gum, and I think her certainly her mother was correct, chewing all that gum. Grandma Georgina and Josephine, about anybody chewing that much gum. She will come, it will come to a sticky end, Grandma Georgina or Josephine, whoever. Which one of them said that? It's true. And you would think that if, if uh, Violet Beauregard's mother didn't want her chewing gum, that she would simply tell her not to chew the gum or limit it. But evidently, this Violet Beauregard does whatever she wants. As a matter of fact, she even puts her... Uh, ABC gum. ABC gum has already been chewed on the buttons in the elevator so that someone comes along unknowingly pushes a button to go up or down they're going to put their finger in some gooey spit laden gum this little girl's disgusting and my tv this kid is all about the tv <laughs> he's telling all these grown-ups to shut up to stop talking and i guess that kind of behavior is okay with his mom and dad so whatever, I, I, I'm with the grandparents here and wondering, are all kids this way? You remember, all the grandparents in the Bucket household have been in that bed for 20 years. So uh, all the children on the outside, of course, the one, the, the one child that they know and love with all of their hearts, Charlie, is nothing like these children. Anyway, uh, thanks for coming back. I hope you come back again for chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 is entitled... Grandpa Joe takes a gamble. Ooh, I wonder what that could mean. Don't know, but I'm excited. Take care. Uh, stay safe when you go out. Mask up. Keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth. Uh, stay safe. Have some fun. Enjoy your summer. Go swimming. Bye-bye.